Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul. Hopefully you're having an amazing day. There is a couple of very interesting pieces of news regarding the Xbox ecosystem. The first of which is a really big update for the Xbox OS, and it's going to make it a lot more compartmentalized. Now, one of the big benefits, of course, the Xbox has over a PC is that a PC can run with a myriad of different hardware configurations. You could have an AMD or an Intel processor. You could have an NVIDIA or AMD GPU. And even if you had, let's say, an AMD GPU, which card specifically? Because obviously not only there are multiple generations of cards, but there are also different product tiers amongst those different GPUs. So, of course, that's not really the case with the Xbox. While there are some changes, naturally, to the OS installs of, let's say, the Xbox Series X versus the Xbox One base system, well, the actual hardware with Xbox Series X really doesn't change any between, you know, a version of the Xbox which is released in three or four years' time. The fundamentals of the system are still going to be the same in terms of the base configuration. This allows the uh, teams over at Microsoft to really streamline the operating system and to squeeze, of course, the most out of the hardware. And it's the same thing for any uh, modern console, whether it's the PlayStation, Xbox, Nintendo Switch, because it's fixed hardware, you can squeeze the most out of it and really kind of code down to the metal. But with that said, one of the problems with the Xbox at the moment is if you want to have an update to the operating system, it could be something small, such as a couple of minor revisions to the shell itself, you would need to do a complete system uh, update. So in other words, the entire OS needs to get sent out and then obviously that needs to be updated for the Xbox. A couple of days ago, Microsoft's Brad Rossetti actually tweeted about this. Xbox Insiders, a new subset of Amiga users will be a new build at 6 p.m. today that updates some settings. We are flighting a new build process in which we can flight new system experiences like shell, settings, guides without full system builds, aka platform fixes. It's agile. So what does this mean for you as the end user? Well, several things. It means that operating system fixes, tweaks, enhancements can be rolled out much more effectively and faster. It should also mean that operating system updates are smaller in size, depending on how obviously they uh, or how much of the operating system needs to be updated from one update to another, as well as the update itself theoretically being much faster to install. Outside of all of this, it also gives the team a lot more scope and freedom to start tweaking and optimizing the operating system in the future. And naturally, as consoles start to age and developers start to really get a handle on the system, as well as... Um, the console manufacturer has time to actually optimize the software around the system, they can do things like optimizing the memory footprint and squeezing down the amount of RAM. Now, this is not to say that this will necessarily happen because of this, but it does stand them in really good stead. Another fantastic piece of news actually regarding the Xbox platform is that there are a ton of exclusive games coming for the Xbox platform in 2021. So first of all, we'll start things out with official news, and this is a blog post. It's actually really lengthy, so I'm not going to read out all of the games because I will be here for the next 24 hours kind of going through all of this game all of these games. But a couple of uh, highlights, at least in my opinion, is Warhammer 40,000 Dark Tide. There's also, of course, Halo Infinite. There's the Yakuza Remastered Collection, uh, which is coming uh, January 28th, as well as Yakuza 6, which is coming a couple of months later. Although it's worth noting that this isn't technically exclusive, but it will be on the Game Pass, and obviously it has numerous enhancements anyway. Microsoft Flight Simulator is also making its way to the system. Psychonauts 2, Scorn, which looks really interesting. I mean, we haven't really seen much gameplay of that so far, but it honestly looked really cool um, when they revealed it. It really it really resonated with me. I'm actually a really big fan of like kind of horror titles. Uh, it's one of the reasons actually I'm really interested in the medium, which is releasing a couple, less than a couple of weeks actually. I've got it already uh, ordered on Steam, so I'm super hyped about that. Yes, I know it's on Game Pass, but I just wanted to kind of support the developers and give them a little bit of extra cash and actually purchase it. Halo Infinite is the big one. Um, obviously, it got delayed heavily, and developers are stating that the graphics have been brought up significantly versus what we saw with the whole Craig meme. 
So I'm actually quite hopeful about that. I don't play it online or anything, but I am a really big fan of the Halo storyline. I I'm actually just recently completed uh, Gears 5's Hive Buster campaign as well, which I thought is pretty great. Uh, I know that's not listed here, but I just wanted to mention it because a couple of people actually were asking me about uh, Hive Busters on Twitter. It's actually quite a short experience. I made it last about three and a half to four hours because I was deliberately dying and kind of redoing encounters, but the in-game time said it was about, I think it was two and a half-ish hours, and that was definitely worth trying. But there was another really big uh, thing for the Xbox as well, and that is that while all of these games sound interesting and cool, apparently they are not all of the big titles. In fact, um, this actually comes to us through a uh, EA DICE developer. Obviously, they work on Battlefield, and he posted on Reset Era, I'll link, of course, to this, plus all of the other relevant topics in the video description, and he said that there are a number of things which were just not announced yet. And this seems to be what I'm hearing as well, that there are a ton of really big things for the Xbox which have just not been announced officially. Obviously, we know titles like Perfect Dark are being worked on, and those are not exactly secret, but there are also a ton of other games as well. And I think Sony and Microsoft have tons of irons in the fire because ultimately they need to obviously convince you to plonk down money to step into that ecosystem. I'm actually really looking forward to seeing what Microsoft bring to the table. I think that the narrative of Xbox not having any games is going to start to dry up over the next couple of years, especially now that obviously they've bought uh, companies like ZeniMax. This is not to say that they're going to just immediately start competing with Sony and everything's going to be hunky-dory. At the end of the day, Sony have really strong narrative experiences like uh, God of War Ragnarok is, well, yeah, it's God of War, just for sake of argument. But I think Microsoft will definitely be able to convince people to step into that ecosystem. And honestly, with the Game Pass as well, it just seems to be the gift that keeps giving. I actually really love Xbox Game Pass. I use it quite extensively. Switching our way from uh, Xbox, I do want to discuss some really interesting news concerning Intel's Rocket Lake, as honestly, this processor architecture, as well as the processors, which of course comprise it, are just, well, yeah, they're just, it's bloody weird, dude. <laughs> Let's just say that. So first of all, there's actually some leaked benchmarks. Now, I will add a quick caveat that while I think these benchmarks are genuine, in other words, I don't think that someone just, you know, made them up because of there's tons of evidence in the video which has actually been uh, linked regarding this, and I will, of course, link all of that in the video description. But while that's true, um, it's worth noting that these processes are not formally available yet. So because BIOS updates and stuff are a thing which can improve performance, it is slightly possible that we could get better performance at the end of the day. Nevertheless, the testing setup, and we'll get to prices in just a moment, is pretty simple. They took an 11900K and a 10900K, and they overclocked both processors to 5.2 gigahertz. That's an all-core uh, clock frequency, so 5.2 gigahertz across either the 8 cores of the 11900 or the 10 cores of the 10900K. They left the voltage as default and it hit 1.48 volts, and apparently it was a chiller that was required to actually maintain 5.2 gigahertz. So again, you're probably not going to be able to achieve this on a weedy cooler by any stretch of the imagination. So CPU Z, um, the 11900K was about 11% faster than the 10900K, but that's with single thread performance, but it was 12% slower in multi-core. Cinebench um, R15, the 11900K, much the same thing, 12% faster in single, but 12% slower in multi. Cinebench R20 in 23, well, yeah, this was a bit odd. The um, 11900K was 16% faster but again, when it came to multi-thread, the uh, Rocket Lake processor just got absolutely stomped. Furthermore, Harakazi 5719 actually compiled some benchmarks about this. And you can see them yourself with uh, the 11900K seemingly just getting it outpaced, at least in 3D mark with the CPU score. It's not massive. I mean, after all, it is 3D Mark, so it's not exactly real world. But even so, if we pick on Time Spy for a moment, 13,049 for the 10900K, 12,183. So we're almost a thousand points uh, less just by 
upgrading to the 11900K. And this seems to be also very similar for game benchmarks across the board. We also have some game benchmarks and yeah, there was several games uh, which were being tested. We've got Shadow of the Tomb Raider, Wolfenstein, Cyberpunk, Assassin's Creed, Total War, and finally PUBG. I don't really know what to say about this one. I mean, just looking at the average FPS as well as the maximum FPS, it's pretty clear that, well, just the 11900K is not exactly flexing its muscles. If we look at the average frame rate, for example, in PUBG, the 11900K is pulling in just 236 FPS compared to 274 of the 10900K. Shadow of the Tomb Raider, again, um, well, yeah, it's a slight win for the 10900K. It's just uh, eight frames a second faster, but yeah, it shouldn't be that direction. Uh, and the same thing even for Assassin's Creed Valhalla. Um, with 82 frames a second for both average, but the maximum frames a second, uh, yeah, it was fast. It was 9 FPS faster for the um, 10900K. Again, I will stress that these benchmarks are of unreleased hardware with still very early BIOSes, so it is possible that we will see faster performance, like improvements just in general with later BIOSes, but this is not looking good at all for Intel. And possibly, if this is true, if these results are accurate, and I stress the word if, but if they are accurate, this might be why Intel is so keen to push Alder Lake already. They already announced Alder Lake at CES. They literally were kind of showing off. They didn't provide benchmarks yet because it's still quite en uh, early engineering samples. But imagine if back when Zen 2 launched, AMD were like, oh yeah, and here's Zen 3 as well, and we're already showing ES. It doesn't really strike as confidence building. It's like if NVIDIA was showing Ampere, and then they were like, oh, and by the way, here's our new architecture as well. We're going to kind of, you know, just show it. We're not going like, to tell us the performance or anything. But yeah, don't, don't worry, guys. We've also got this. It doesn't really show that much confidence in the product. And... Perhaps another problem as well is just the pricing. So there have now been several leaks regarding the pricing of the 11th generation. And I'm not sure about these prices at all, especially for the uh, higher end SKUs like the 11900K. So these have actually been compiled from a couple of different vendors and have been compiled. And yeah, I don't think the 1100K, sorry, 11900K, excuse me, is looking like it's going to be worth it, given it's still an 8-core, 16-thread configuration, um, which is the same as the 11700K. I say this in ignorance because I haven't tested these processors or anything like that, but perhaps the actual winner here for gaming, depending on the final performance, could actually be the 11600K. So the 11600K is retailing at around 230 to 250, sometimes a little more in terms of euros. And this could end up being cheaper, therefore, than the Ryzen 5600X, which might mean for pure gaming, depending on availability and final prices, as well as, of course, other things such as the uh, heat output and all of that type of thing, as well as availability, this might be the CPU that a ton of people go for. After all, you can still actually overclock this, and presumably it would also be less power uh, demanding as well. Ultimately, if Ryzen 5000 is still under shortages, which I wouldn't be surprised, AMD have said that the, um, you know, the leanness of inventory is going to continue throughout Q1 and possibly even into Q2. So maybe if Rocket Lake launches with decent quantities of the 11600K, it could be an option for gamers. Yeah, at the end of the day though, I'm just gonna wait and see at this point. These numbers are a little concerning to me. I'm not quite ready to bury Rocket Lake yet. It's just kind of concerning that we are seeing these results. It's possibly something to do with the BIOS. Another possibility is just that the actual, well, architecture is being held back in some way or another. I seem to remember that uh, the underlying architecture does have a higher um, latency for the caches compared to what uh, we saw with Skylake. So that could be another reason that this is causing problems. But 
ultimately we can only wait and uh, you know kind of see from actual testing with that said though thank you very much for watching the video take care of yourselves bye for now